He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, upon this your confession, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us worship him. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great. with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the good seed of your holy word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and bring forth fruits in faith, hope, and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for this Sunday, which is the fifth Sunday after the festival of the Holy Trinity, is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah. We read from the 26th chapter of his prophecy. We begin reading with the first verse there. Um, I invite you to join in reading responsibly. And uh, the context here is that at the end of chapter 25, the previous chapter, the Lord has of the enemies of God's people, especially those living across the Jordan River in the land of Moab. And, and now uh, Isaiah records a promise that God's people will be rid of their sin in the, in view of the fact that their enemies are going to be destroyed. They'll be freed from them. And it's above all a promise to keep the, the peace that the Lord promises to keep us, to, to keep what he promises and to put Isaiah 26. On that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. And our God has a salvation, and it is called the city of God. Open the gates so that the righteous nation may enter. For the nation that guards the truth. You preserve perfect peace for the person whose resolve is steadfast. He says he trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. He humbles those who live in a high place, in a high, secure city. He brings it down to the ground. It is trampled down by the feet of the poor. The way of the righteous is level and smooth. Truly, Lord, we have waited paths of your judgments. My soul longs for you during the night. Because when your judgments are known on earth,
Although grace is shown to the wicked, they will continue to act unjustly in a righteous land. Lord, your hand is raised, ready to strike, but they do not see it. And they will be put to shame. O Lord, you establish peace for us. O Lord, our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us. Here ends our Old Testament reading. We invite you to join in singing our psalm for today. It's Psalm 85. Uh, you'll find it in your hymnal on page 97. But Psalm 85 continues the theme of the peace that God grants to him. Our epistle reading is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Christians living in the city of Philippi. We read from the fourth chapter of that letter. We begin reading at the fourth verse. And here shows us what it means to have God that transcends through many different circumstances and situations in his life. And yet he was confident that he could do all things. He had God's peace knowing that he could do all things through the strength of his Lord Jesus Christ. We read from Philippians 4, St. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. Surpasses all understanding. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if anything is excellent and if anything is praiseworthy, think about these things. The things that you learned, received, heard, and saw in me, keep doing these things, and the God of peace will be with you. 
I rejoice greatly in the Lord now that you have revived, you, revived your concern for me once again. Actually, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I lack anything. In fact, I have learned to be content in any circumstances in which I find myself. I know what it is to live in humble circumstances, and I know what it is to have more than enough. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether being full or hungry, while having plenty or not enough. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand and we'll join in confessing our Christian faith. This evening we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for our next hymn.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you continue believing in him that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word of God for our consideration this evening is taken from the gospel according to St. Luke. We read from the 10th chapter of his gospel beginning at the 38th verse where uh, in a busy word reminds us of godly priorities. St. Luke writes, as they went on their way, Jesus came into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who was sitting at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her serving. She came over and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve all alone? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered and told her, Martha, Martha. You are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. In fact, Mary has chosen that better part away from her. And we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Dear fellow redeemed friends in Christ Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior, reminds us this evening that there's really just one thing that we truly need. Many years ago, when I was first starting out my ministry, I closed a service during the summer months with a prayer that I had found in the Meditations devotional book. I still have it. It's from about 1984 and 85, that book. Anyway, uh, the service had dealt with the wonders and beauty of God's creation and how during the summertime it's nice to get out and to, to look at what God has made and to be reminded of how manifold are the works of our God. And I closed that service with this prayer and Part of it goes like this. For these days of summer, days which are a little slower, days which are a little better for times with our family and friends, we thank you, Lord. I thought that was a pretty good prayer. That was until I was greeting people at the door, and a, a gentleman came out and uh, very politely, he had a comment for me. Now, I'll tell you something about this gentleman. Uh, he was a farmer in Nebraska. And uh, he said to me, sort of like, speak for yourself about these days being slower and a little better to be with your family and friends. He said, I'm a farmer. I got crops to tend to every day. I got irrigation pipe that I've got to move every day. These days aren't slower for me. And I think he understood that I was talking in terms of, well, it's, uh, it's summer. The school year is over with, uh, with all of its activities and its meetings and busy things on the calendar. I think he understood that. But his point was well taken. And I think what he said about himself, my former member and farmer friend, uh, what he said about himself, that these days of summer are not slower, I think that's probably become true for most of us, too. It would be nice, but the reality is if you have children, if it's not play days, sports, practices, or games, jobs that they have to get to, if it's not weddings, anniversaries, family reunions and, reunions and retirement parties that you have to try to get to, then it's, uh, it's trying to take a vacation with the family. And if preparing to go on vacation isn't enough to make your head spin, 
than certainly coming back from vacation and trying to get caught up again is. It's a busy time, even though it's summer. The days aren't necessarily slower. And that's why it's good that in our lectionary, we were working through the Gospel of Luke this summer. And it just happens that we have this beautiful little account before us from Luke chapter 10 that we know as the story of Mary and Martha. And, and it's simply a reminder in a busy season, in every busy season of our lives, the reminder is simply this about our priorities. There's really just one thing that we need. It's the Word of God. And why is that the one thing that we need? Well, as we look at the Word of God before us, this familiar account, we'll see that the Word of God is the one thing that we need so that we can have, first of all, the peace of God, and then secondly, so that our service will be pleasing to God. It's really very simple. There's just one thing that we need, Jesus says. It's the Word of God, to sit and listen to the Word of God. And, and, and it's the one thing that we needed so that our souls can have the peace of God. It's just a little account. You'll learn it in Sunday school. Looks very sparse with details here. He doesn't name the village. Now, you probably know the name of the village. At least we assume that it's Bethany because we know that that's where Mary and Martha lived. He doesn't mention the fact that Lazarus lived in the same house as his sisters Mary and Martha. He doesn't even mention Lazarus. He doesn't give us a lot of details, Luke doesn't. But he does include one little word in Greek that is not translated by either the New International Version or the EHV that we have before us. It was translated in the King James Version. It's just a little word. In Greek, it's a chi. It's a flexible word. It's translated lots of different times, usually and, but sometimes also. And he puts it, Luke puts it in there by inspiration of God the Holy Spirit when he's introducing Mary to us. And he says that Martha had a sister named Mary. The King James Version said this, which was also sitting and listening to the Lord. It's just a little word, also. But it helps us get the complete picture here. If, if you have in your mind when you hear about Mary and Martha that, well, here's Martha, and she was a hardworking, industrious type, and she wanted everything to be just right for Jesus. And then there was Mary, and she was a good-for-nothing slacker who had no concern that the house be ready or that the meal be prepared, and she was willing to just sit there and let Martha do the work. That little word also clears up any confusion. It tells us that Mary and Martha were both busy getting ready for Jesus to, to arrive. This was, a, this was a wonderful thing to have Jesus with his disciples come to Martha's house. She wanted everything to be ready. Mary was right there working with her until the Savior himself appeared, came to the house, sat down, and began to teach. And that's when Mary, who had also been working, put away her chores, put away the preparations, and sat down at the Savior's feet. And what's the result of Martha continuing furiously to prepare and Mary sitting at the Savior's feet. It's that contrast that we see. Mary sits calm and peacefully at rest at the Savior's feet, listening and learning from him. Martha, on the other hand, 
Well, what does Jesus say about her? Uh, Luke says, first of all, that Martha was distracted with all her serving. And Jesus describes her as worried and upset about many things. You can, you can kind of picture her, can't you? She's cleaning the house. She's getting the meal ready. You can kind of imagine that her hair was a fright. And sweat was running down her face. And her hands were, were white with uh, flour or dough stuck to them and 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 she's frustrated and and upset and she comes to Jesus and she thinks he's got to listen here I am I'm working to get ready for his meal and for his visit with his disciples and and here's my sister sitting there but if she thought that Jesus was going to take her side she was wrong Martha Martha you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. What Jesus is telling Martha is that her distracted, worried, and upset soul needs one thing. It needs the Word of God. Because the Holy Spirit works through the Word of God to bring peace to the hearts of His people. The psalm writer in Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. Great peace. That's what our Lord promises to those who will sit and listen to his word. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that if Martha had, had put away her chores, and put away the preparations for a little while and sat down at Jesus' feet. Just all miraculously, everything would have gotten ready. Everything would have been prepared for, for the meal. I don't know, maybe. Uh, what does St. Paul say in Ephesians chapter 3 in his prayer to God? He says, our God is able according to the power that is at work within us, to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. Is it beyond God's ability to miraculously make the preparations? If Martha didn't, sure. Maybe, though, as Martha would sit at Jesus' feet, maybe she'd be reminded of our Lord's command and promise. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Maybe as she sat at the Savior's feet, she would be led to think about all the things that were so important to her. And, and, and maybe, maybe she'd start to, to realize that maybe all these things that are so important to me, maybe in the overall scheme of things, Maybe in view of eternity that will be spent either in hell apart from God or in heaven with him. Maybe all of these things that are weighing on my mind are really not that important. Maybe, maybe she would have heard something like a hymn stanza that um, we sometimes sing. It goes like this. Many spend their lives in fretting over trifles and in getting, things that have no solid ground, I shall strive to win a treasure that will bring me lasting pleasure and that now is seldom found. If Martha had simply put away her preparations, would everything have gotten done? Would she have had time? Maybe. God once gave Joshua a job to do. And when he needed more time to finish that job, he prayed to God to extend the day, and the Lord did, so he could. The point is this, that when our souls are distracted and worried and upset, what we need above all is to sit and listen to our Savior.
That is the worship that pleases God above all. So often we want to be the hosts and make the Lord into the guest. We want to be the giver and the Lord the receiver. And, and our Lord wants it to be just the opposite. Our Savior told us that when he said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We honor our Savior best and serve him in the highest way possible when we clear our schedules and our minds to sit at his feet and learn from him, read and hear his word. And I, I, can, I can just imagine that with, within all of us, there's this, there's this sinful nature, right? We talked about it last time. It wars against the desires of the spirit within us. And I can imagine that the sinful nature in us is just doing a great big eye roll and going, yeah. Yeah, like if I, if I just put away everything and sit at the Savior's feet and let him feed me, then I'm going to be at peace. And, and, and when that happens to me, because I got the same sinful nature, I always remember a comment, uh, a quote from a writer by the name of G.K. Chesterton. And, and his comment was this. He said, the Christian ideal in other words, God's plan for our lives. He says, it, it hasn't been tried and found to be wanting. In other words, it, it hasn't been tried and found to be a failure. What Chesterton says is, it's been found difficult and left untried. You know what that means? That means that it's not easy to trust in the Lord and to trust his promise that great peace have they who love his law and nothing can make them stumble. We have a sinful enemy that lives right within us. And we need to take our own thoughts captive and we need to crucify that old unbelieving enemy within us and trust the words and promises of our God because our God is trustworthy. The greatest promise that he made was to send his son to be our savior, and he did it. And though it cost him the life of his son on the cross, he was willing to make that sacrifice, and he kept his word. Not one word of all the good promises that God has given us has ever fallen to the ground unfulfilled. Those are Solomon's words. And it's still true for us. And we always need to keep that in mind in, in this world where it's so easy to lose our focus, to lose sight of our Christian priorities, where our souls can become worried and upset. It happens with busy schedules, trying to get everything done that needs to be done. We need to trust that there is just one thing that we need for our souls to have the peace of God. The confidence that St. Paul articulated, for example, in our epistle reading, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Whether it's facing plenty or want, whether it's being full or hungry, through him who gives us strength, we have the courage, the confidence, and the peace that we can face it. When it's our sins that worry us and trouble us, and well, they should, for the wages of sin is death, and the soul that sins must die. But sit at Jesus' feet. Listen to his word. Proclaimed by the prophet Isaiah, for example. 
as he speaks of the Savior and says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We look around in, in this world, and we see soaring inflation, costs of raising children, making us wonder how we're going to do it. We see borders that leak like sieves, looming recession, war in Ukraine. Do I have to go on? And we're supposed to have peace? And our Lord says to our troubled hearts, come, come and sit for a minute. Hear my promise. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to, to give you peace. To prosper you is the way we learned it in the NIV. But it's the word shalom. It's that beautiful word peace. My plans are not to harm you, but to give you peace, to give you hope and a future. Those are the words and promises of our Lord. I told you that Luke was pretty sparse with details. Did you notice that he doesn't tell us what happened? You think Martha put away her chores and her preparations? You think she sat down there with Mary? He doesn't tell us what Jesus talked about. But boy, what a blessing it would have been for Martha to sit there at the Savior's feet. Because if you know your gospel history, it wouldn't be that many days away. And Mary and Martha's sister Lazarus would lay dead in a grave. And how she would need then what the Lord offered her here. And that is the peace of God that transcends all understanding and guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come, Jesus says. Come to me, all you who are, are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's the one thing we need, God's word. We need it so that our souls can have the peace of God. We need it so that our service will be pleasing to God. So the question comes up a lot of times with this reading, small as it is, short as it is, simple as it is. The, re the, the question comes up a lot of times, so what about Mary's service? What about, what, what about Martha's work? What about everything that she was trying to do for the Savior? Didn't Jesus want her to do that? Was that bad that she was trying to make a meal for Jesus and his disciples, that she was trying to make her house ready for their visit? Was, was that a bad thing? Of course not. Uh, Luther summarizes God's will for his people when he says of Jesus' work, all this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. We were saved to serve. Martha was saved to serve. Jesus doesn't criticize her work. She loved her Savior. That's clear from the invitation that she extended for Jesus and his disciples to come into her house. She believed in Jesus as her Savior. That's clear from when her brother Lazarus died and she met Jesus and was asked about what she believed about him and she said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. What was wrong here was not Martha's service. What was wrong here were her priorities. The service was right. The time was wrong. Jesus was there to teach, to feed, to strengthen the faith of Mary and Martha. 
And Martha was too distracted to be served by the Savior. And so the Lord called her out on it. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset by many things, but only one thing is needed. And we need it too, so that our service to God will be pleasing to him. We also need to be reminded of this, because, because again, we can get so wrapped up in wanting to serve, so busy, that all of a sudden we don't have time for the Savior and his word. And we don't have time anymore to honor him in the best way possible by honoring him as our Savior and believing and trusting in him for the forgiveness of our sins, being fed with his living and enduring word, being fed with his body and blood here in the supper for the forgiveness of our sins, for the increase of our faith and hope and love. You always need to remember that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And for our service to be pleasing to God, we need to have our priorities right. Because it's possible that we get so wrapped up in wanting to serve. An example, something that I've heard. People saying, ah, you know what, I, I really don't, I just don't have time to be in God's house, to hear his word, to be fed by him. But, you know, if there's anything you need done, if you need, a, you know, if I can write a check, um, you know, just let me know. And, and, and that's just upside down. What the Lord wants, first of all, is that we give ourselves to him that we give our hearts to him. And then the rest will follow and be a sweet-smelling sacrifice that pleases him. It's possible for parents to forget their priorities. And all of a sudden, you get so wrapped up with your children's activities and the practices and the rehearsals and the, and the events and the games. And all of a sudden, there's really not a whole lot of time left for worship, for Sunday school, for memorizing uh, the, the passages or the parts of the catechism. And, 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 you know, you can just hear parents say, well, doesn't God want me to be a parent who gets my children involved? Doesn't he want my children to learn how to play sports and, and how to play musical? No, that's not the thing. All of that has its place. But it's not first place. That belongs to the Lord and his word. Churches, all of us need to keep this in mind. That there's one thing that's needed for our service to be pleasing to God. And that is for us to sit and listen to the word of God. Because you know that in many churches, that's becoming a rarer and rarer thing. It's all about busyness and all about sins. And it's and political action and it's social justice and it's women's right reproductive rights and it's saving the whales and it's cleaning up the highways. And if I might humbly suggest that there could be more sitting and listening to the word of God being done. And when that happens, when we sit and listen and let Jesus feed us, then the works will come. The works will flow naturally, spontaneously. Fruits of faith and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just think about Mary. This isn't the last time we see Mary sitting at the Savior's feet being fed by him. We see her shortly before Jesus was betrayed. She comes and finds him, and she has in her hand a bottle of expensive ointment, and she uses it to anoint the Savior. And oh, she was criticized 
She was criticized by Judas and the other disciples for spending such, such a huge amount of money on the Savior. But Jesus defended her and said that she had anointed the Savior in view of his coming crucifixion and burial. It was, it was a God-pleasing act of love that Mary did spontaneously. Look at Mary on the other, uh, Martha on the other hand. When, when, when she failed to be fed by the Savior, all of a sudden her service, well, look at her. She's looking around at her sister. Well, she's not doing anything. Look at me. Look at how hard I'm working. Why do I have to do this all by myself? All of a sudden, her service to the Savior was not a joyful act of, of faith and, and a fruit of her faith and an act of love. All of a sudden, there was resentment. And, and so it is that for our service as Christians, as parents, as a Christian church, for this service to be pleasing to God. It starts here with the one thing that we truly need, the Word of God. Jesus makes it so simple, doesn't he? Doesn't he just focus our priorities? I had a baseball coach when I was in college, and he was famous for saying, baseball is a simple game. He said three things. You throw the ball, you hit the ball, you catch the ball. That's it. It's easy. Jesus makes it easier. It's about one thing. God's word is that one thing that we need for our souls to have the peace of God in these tumultuous times and for our service to be pleasing to God. What a wonderful thing it would be if where it reads Mary at the end of our reading, you could put your name in there. You have chosen that better part and it will not be taken away. Amen. Please stand. In response to the word of God, let's join in singing the closing stanza of our hymn as it's printed. Please join in the responsive prayer of the church. God of all grace, we thank you for the gift of eternal life in your Son. By the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and by the faithful testimony of the apostles, you have assured us that our faith stands on a sure and solid foundation. Though we do not see Jesus with our physical eyes, help us to see him with the eyes of faith. Through your Holy Spirit, breathe on your church that it may faithfully proclaim the gospel of our risen Savior with courage and diligence in all lands and to all people. Grant that we also may be illumined by the heavenly light of your word and so keep us in the one and only true faith. Preserve us from all assaults on our souls. Deliver us from doubt and despair and preserve us from worldly wisdom and false teaching. Turn my eyes from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Forgive the sins of your people. Strengthen the doubting and faithless. Bring back the forgetful and the wayward and comfort the anxious and distressed.
As we go from this holy place today, grant peace and rest to us all. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for our next hymn. Please stand for prayer. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Please join us in your closing hymn.
Once again, welcome. Sorry about this. I don't know if it's a hearing loop that's in the deal is, but maybe we need to get that checked out. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, sorry about that. We need to get that straightened out so that you're not getting quite as much feedback. Um, uh, in the meantime, we'll let somebody speak who doesn't have that is our congregational and he just wants to kind of introduce and put in a plug for the pictorial directory that we're going to be starting. There you go. Uh, don't forget that uh, next week we will have our uh, summer uh, Bible camp, our vacation Bible school. Runs Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of next week. So if you'd still like to register students or uh, sign up to help yourselves, you certainly can. Keep in mind that our women's Bible class is, is running on Wednesday mornings, 930. Also our Sunday Bible class is going again, and we are in the book of Psalms. That meets at 8 o'clock right before the 9 o'clock service starts. So. Keep all that in mind. Nice to see all of you here tonight. A special welcome to those who are visiting and our guests. Good to have you with us. It is always our privilege to proclaim to you the word of our God. Uh, it was a good reminder from uh, that farmer friend and former member that uh, the summer days are not necessarily slower. Sometimes the schedules are just as hectic, and it's good to be reminded of the right priorities in these busy times. And that is the one thing that we need, the one thing that we need is to sit and listen to the word of God. And then our souls will have the peace of God and then our service will be pleasing to God. If you're visiting, please take a moment to sign one of the care cards in the pew or the guest book in the back. Please come back and visit again very soon. God bless your trip home tonight, the rest of the week and the weekend ahead in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.